Hi, I'm uh, Max Dale, and I'm here uh, on Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. And I'm, I'm really interested to see which games we're going to be changing today and, 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 and exchanging. So uh, let's see what happens. Okay. Are you okay, with us? Okay, I'm with I'm with you now. I had to get rid of Steve Ferroni. That's so annoying. Thank you for doing that, Max. I am I am so thrilled to meet you. You have been so lovely to deal with um, in this whole process. That's that hasn't been very long, just a few months. But thank you for being so agreeable and so lovely. Well, I I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to talking more with you. You know, I just listened to something that you did with your um, with your general hospital son, and mm -hmm. you did you did a little sh you did a show with him, and yeah, he has he, a show. Uh, uh, um, goodness gracious, state of mind, state of mind, yeah, and he, he yeah. speaks very openly about his own issues with with mental illness and with his yeah. struggles. But what really struck me about it, you're a wonderful listener. And I think that's part of the reason why you're such a good actor, because you well, really pay attention and you know when to listen. Yeah, well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, that's where the juice is in the listening. I, okay, you know, I have so. no idea how you came to this, because from what I read, okay, you're Michigan, you, you're, you're Umich, and um and but you were you were like a smarty pants. You like have degree. You have you have a master's. Like you didn't study drama, did you? No, I didn't. I my my uh, my mother had been a, an actress. She got married at twenty one. My dad was thirty two. My dad had had a big band. He was a piano player. Uh, had a big band in that day, you know. But he also uh, got into booking bands, and that's one of the ways he raised. They got married right when the war was happening. My my mother had four pregnancies and three of them were twins. So that so they is had, insane. Were, yeah, seven of us in six years. You know, so so there was that. Um, but uh, you know, it probably if somebody had asked back in those days, you know, who's going to have a uh, an acting career? So it would have been my twin sister Mary or my my younger brother, the one single in the family, Scanlon, who is an actor. He's a very good actor. And, um, uh, he didn't get lucky enough to get into a really beautifully written show like Barney Miller, you know, with a great kind of ensemble thing going on, you know, that um, um, so, uh, but so that was there. Um, I was more, you know, I was better at, at science. I got that more. I sat in AP English class while the other, most, mostly other girls, but whoever, you know, just kind of scratching my head and trying to think of something that sounded right to say or something, but I really didn't quite get it, you know, but I, and I went off to a small college in Massachusetts that had a, had a program where you'd go three years there and two years to MIT and you'd get a BA and a BS. And that just was enough cover to talk about what I was going to do, which I didn't have a clue. Well, oh, I was going to say, so I'm what here. did you, what did you plan to do with it? You didn't know. What I you had no idea, but, but you know, you graduate from high school and everybody wants to know what you're going to do and you, you, you want to have an answer. You know, <laughs> yeah. the main reason that I went to Williams was I was an exchange student this summer before my senior year that we participated in this thing called the American field service. So we would have a student from somewhere else for the school year. And then someone from each class, each junior class would get picked to be the exchange student and I went to Germany and on the oh, way wow. back and the, did you uh, did you speak did you speak German no no I you know I learned a bit I was a family I stayed with the, the the brother that was the you know that was my family my brother had actually spent a year in the states as an exchange student most of the friends I had were um, also you know spoke English and stuff so I began to pick it up I find if I if I'm Speaking a foreign, you know, whatever I can do with a foreign language, if they don't, if their English isn't better, and you know, better way, if somebody's English is much better than mine, then I'm I freeze up. Even with Spanish, having lived in California all these years, my Spanish is, you know, poor. Uh, the fact that you there have was any a, there is a, is there was a there, there was a band. This other guy and I decided we would hitchhike back from New York where the boat landed, and he wanted to check out Princeton. There was a banjo player in the band from Princeton, but the piano player. Okay, no, wait, get back to the band. So when did you start playing music? 
Well, I'd been playing, and I started uh, in junior high. My, my junior sister high. was the one who sat next to my dad and played the Moonlight Sonata and played her flute and stuff, you know. But uh, somebody showed me some chords for a basic 12-bar blues, you know, a little, little riff. And I, uh, and then I was doing that. My dad came out and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a C chord. And, uh, you know, he, be, he gave me kind of the basic outline. But I'd been around music, you know, so right. I, I, I had a, a way into it. I never got good at reading other than I could read out of a fake book, you know, the one melody line in the chord. Right. If, particularly if I knew how the song went. Mm -hmm. But this guy was um, uh, Albert Early. I remember he was. First of all, he was an athlete. He was a wrestler. There's no mistake. And he was an athlete, you know, and he was playing the piano in the band and he was a good piano player. And he had this kind of shaggy, curly hair, you know, I mean, this was before the Beatles showed up with their long hair, which is <laughs> a crew cut today. You know? yeah. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, you know, I just wanted to know, and I'd never heard of Wales. So it wasn't like an Eastern college or something. And, and I, we hitchhiked and we stopped at Princeton and we stopped there and I ended up going going there is that where you went to school with gilda radner i know you went to school with gilda no somewhere. then I, so then i so then i so i graduated there i ended i didn't want to go to mit i realized you know i loved all the theory of physics and all that but i i had no interest in the labs and that sort of thing and i arced over into economics so i always say i got my B, ba i got my bs degree by getting a ba in economics <laughs> because it's a guessing game you know and uh, people have won pulitzer prizes since then pointing out that the basic assumptions at the time were wrong. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I went back, I taught ancient history and English for two years in a private school that hired me, it kept me out of Vietnam, uh -huh. which at the time I didn't have a, such a strong political thing. I had what I, 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 I learned one night in my early thirties up late talking with my mom and I don't remember what it was she said, but her dad was a World War I psychological catch. You know, he was a wonderful Irish grandpa. He would have times where he was, um, you know, they were living on Fifth Avenue or they were in Miami. And then he'd go off on a, you know, months long bender and, and, and she'd go back with her stepmother to Fremont, Ohio and stuff. And, he, you know, he made mistakes as a dad. So she planted in my brother and my brains in those days. It wasn't really such a thing for girls as a career or as a move and uh um you know just don't do it so when these options came up because you i mean, was don't go to war boy, don't go to war don't go to war and she had told my dad you know and it was but it wasn't about pacifism it was about that it no a, although she she you know her orientation was very much around being i mean uh irish and uh of the soil and uh you know that was uh, my dad kind of, you know, he treated everybody uh, with respect and and balance and, and stuff because he was that kind of person, you know, mm -hmm. but he didn't necessarily, you know, I had an uncle that, that got thrown out of the musicians union because he kept trying to get them to hire more black people at the at the hockey rink and the, and the symphony, which were the kind of the, the gigs, you know, that musicians could, could have other than playing the country club gigs and that sort of thing. And, wow. and uh so, uh, you know, Did, do you think had, you got your advocacy and your activism from your parents? Did it start there for you? Do you think? I don't think so. In this, in the understanding of activism, mm -hmm. you know, which is I got to take action. You know, there's Paulo Freire, that great Brazilian thinker that talked about, you know, there's he's talked about there's the there's there's three life uh, things. There's there's the con con conformity and a re a conformation, conform confirmation. What am I trying to say? And and a reform, which is the good guys have to take over from the bad guys, you know, but often the bad guys end up behaving the same as the good guys they take over, you know, look like oh. what, what what we used to be the Democratic Party. Now it's the Republican Party as far as, you know, suppressing mm -hmm. votes and stuff, you know. So um, in con conformation, he said, you know, uh, some things, you know, try you, you have to conform to some things, you know, try not breathing for a while, you know, and uh uh, and then transformation, which was the one where change can really happen. And for mm -hmm. transformation, you have to have action and reflection. Otherwise, it's action is just activism. So there's a certain thing well, about- Were you a hippie, action. Max? I, I got out to, San, moved out, went out to San Francisco in 69 from, uh, from Michigan. You know, I had stayed, I've been in grad school long enough to, to, uh, to not get drafted. And uh, and I headed out but there. But you I, you didn't get drafted because your mother had 
planted this in your head, don't go to war. Well, but it I wasn't had, so know, much I, that as it well, I because of choices. Vietnam. I, I, made, I made the choice to go to graduate school because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. But did and you not want to go to Vietnam because Vietnam was wrong? Or did you not want to go to Vietnam because your mother had planted this in your well, head? Well, it was pretty clear that it was wrong. But there was also there were also a lot of other things to polls to say, well, do your share or do something. I think I had a I had a f- incredible fear of, you know, combat and all of that. And I had yeah. an equal fear that I might actually like it. Wow. I had a I had another, you know, I had a, all I tell people all my mellowness is is uh, acquired you know wow. i was the oldest i was the oldest at five when i was three i was like the giant you know and i couldn't hear i had really poor hearing it it took them a while to figure out so uh you know and my my mother i think rightly saw raising little children as socializing little animals you know <laughs> So, you know, I got, I got early. I also on. heard you say that you're a triple Aries, which would explain yeah, this. Yeah. Uh... So then, then there's that, you know, so, so anyway, uh, uh, but, you know, it's not like it was such a strange thing, but it was more as far as acting, but I was uh, doing uh, music and I played uh, pickup rock bands and, and, uh, you know, I played, we would play mixers. And stuff. I had a band at Williams with a with a guy named at the time Jimmy Winchester. He, he moved to Canada to, to avoid the draft and changed his name to Jesse Winchester. And he had a wonderful career up there as a songwriter. And uh, you know, if you if you look him up, he's he wrote, wrote a lot of really wonderful songs. But he stayed up there. You know? he, he decided he he just liked the cool cold north. Uh, so we would play, you know, mixers. And then I had to, some piano bar gigs in the dinner hour. Um, uh, so I had enough chops to do that. Well, what was your what, what kind of music were you playing, Max? I was playing from the old songbook from the uh, piano bar, some and 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 Broadway stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And I would sing if it was a serious song, I'd make a joke of it. I you uh-huh. know, but I I I could do uh, Camelot, you know. I I, I that that was mostly it. Um, you know, the girl from Ipanema would be the, this, I mean, I was thinking about it, I go to say it now, and I just, it was the girl from emphysema, the girl with <laughs> emphysema, you know, <laughs> he's one, she passes ears, <gasps> you know, <laughs> the dark humor of a, you know, ignorant young male <laughs> with his poor brain still shaping up, I guess, you know, but anyway, you know, I, I, I had that, I played up at Mackinac Island for two summers in the what they called the snack bar at the end of the golf course, but it's where they encouraged all the drinkers to go. Um, uh, there was a while in there where I, I tried to write songs. They were kind of Tom Lear-like, if you're familiar with Tom Lear. Uh, I'm not. Tom Lear was, a, I think, a Harvard professor who who had a hit album uh, of, of um, songs that were real brainy and funny and kind of sarcastic and... Uh, um, be prepared. That's the Boy Scouts marching song. Be prepared. And he goes on, you know, be prepared. To, anyway, you know, uh, if you're looking for adventure of a new and different kind and you run into a Girl Scout who is similarly inclined, don't be flustered. <laughs> don't be flustered. Don't be scared. Be prepared. He was that, you know, that guy. Uh, uh, but um, the time came where um, I got out to San Francisco. I was playing in the Hyatt House down by the airport from five to nine. And how, wait, how do you, your, are your parents okay that you've got this BS and BA, but you're playing piano bars? How, how, how is this going over? And oh, over? That, my parents were fine with any of us doing what, you know, what we wanted to do. I think my dad, you know, he, he used to say, you got a good touch, you know, and he, he, it was through his office that I got the gig up in, wow. in uh, Mackinac Island and stuff, you know, so I, I had that, um, you had that support. I had a certain uh, shyness that uh, kept me from maybe making those things happen all by myself until I got out to San Francisco. And then it's like, what am I going to do? And the same week I got, uh, I applied, I took the law boards. I was thought, well, I'll go to law school. I can, wow, you know, what I didn't you do? <laughs> well, I, I didn't, I didn't do all that well. And what happened was they, they replaced me with a guy from the marina, a good looking guy with a wonderful suntan and a bunch of Renaissance collar shirts, he sat on a stool and he played his guitar and he played all much more, you know, up to date songs. And, and, and I was out. And at the same time, I had 
on a fluke, I'd seen that the, they had opened this production in one floor over the cuckoo's nest. These guys from San Francisco that had taken the play that Kirk Douglas bought the rights and had Dale Wasserman, right. who went on to write the book for Man of La Mancha, oh, and yeah. Dale Wasserman um, uh, write the play. And, he, and Kirk Douglas did it on Broadway. And Gene Wilder played Billy Bibbit, and mm -hmm. Ed Ames played the chief. And, uh, and it was more, the nurse was more of a comic villain, mm -hmm. like Home Alone sort of comic villain, you know. And these guys took the play and they made it much more like the book including because the chief narrates the book. So including recorded passages of the chief, you know, the, light, the lights would go down and slide yeah. and on the side. And, you, you yeah. know, you hear that, Papa, it's the black machine the way they, they got it going 18 stories down. You know, in his, in his uh, psychotic uh, take on what was going on. Well, I have a question combine. for you, yeah. because yeah. Uh, as I told you, I did Cuckoo's Nest in 75, yeah. which wasn't that much later, but... Our McMurphy looked exactly like Jack Nicholson, uh -huh. except it was before he got cast before we knew Nicholson was coming out in the movie. What did uh -huh. you, did your McMurphy look like the character in the book who was a redheaded, like lumberjack kind of? The guy that Mc... was playing, the guy that was playing it then. Yeah. Yeah. He and, did. Uh -huh. and, and he, and he, cause Fred Cook was his name and it probably still is. But uh, <laughs> so I had gone down to read, it was raining. I didn't want to go to, rugby practice now wait what I, made you think you could act what made you think well, you could do I, I, this okay so so uh at michigan i learned after the first semester of, of you know it's like thirty thousand students there they're all registered it's also yeah. one of the greatest drama departments my daughter auditioned there it's a great drama right, department right well uh so I, I i had signed up for the business school but i had right. learned that if you came back late i could go over and ask you know professor mccracken in the in international finance P, uh, PhD seminar mm -hmm. of, that was limited to 20. So people had camped out, you know, in front of his office wow. or whatever. Yeah. You know? Now I'm three days late. My grandmother died. <laughs> I really wanted to be in here. You know, I know I'm just one more highly motivated person. So I thought, oh, I'm going to try that. I could take, you could take a course out of the business school as long as it was a graduate level course so that you could take an engineering course or a real estate law course, maybe. I couldn't take an a art course because I didn't have any portfolio. <laughs> I'm looking through an oh, drama department, theory of acting. Oh, theory. I'll we'll probably watch movies and write papers. I could do that. <laughs> and I went over with a guy, a friend of mine that was on the a rugby team, Gene Kunit. He was in the landscape architecture. Kind of big, big curly headed Russian Jew with a 52 inch chest. And, you know, we, we sit in the back of this room that that professor was, was uh, rehearsing a bunch of girls for a uh, Greek chorus of a play they were doing. You know, can I help you? No, I can wait. He says, after a while, he comes over. Okay, so what is it? I said, well, I, I want to petition into your, uh, you know, the theory of drama 602 or whatever. He says, are you, uh, are you in the graduate drama department? I said, no, no, I'm not. Are you in the drama department? I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Have you done any plays? I, well, not really. You know? <laughs> and all these girls are looking and he's kind of like, and Gene says, oh, he plays the piano and sings, he's very talented. You know, you should let him in. <laughs> he said, well, okay. You know, I, I, maybe his reason was that he didn't have as many guys in the class as girls. Or something. I don't know. Uh, but Gilda was in that. In that uh, um, actually. And, uh, and it was, a, you know, it was a neat experience and it. It, I did two semesters and it and it it gave me enough that when I saw that they were auditioning for understudies for the this play at the Cuckoo's Nest, it had opened up and gotten a great review from Herb Kane, who was the main columnist. The regular critics, they didn't think much of it. But Herb Kane said, This is the greatest thing to come along. They had it, you know, and and so they offered me the part to understudy the chief. They had a guy playing it who was a, a weightlifter. They had shoes that made him four or five inches taller, you know. Um, and so that was that. You're going to have, what does that mean? Well, you'll have to come down and learn, you know, where to stand, and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. kind of embarrass a little bit. But he's, you know, he doesn't speak for most of the play. So. <laughs> and uh, and, he, and um, I said, okay, so the next thing I know, I'm replaced by this guy. But I also get a call from them. You have to be at the theater by six o'clock. You're going on tonight. But you're, you're also narrating, right, in this version of it? No, no, no. He narrated oh. the narrator of the book. The book is oh. told through the chief's 
dies. Yeah, he's right. not married. Okay. The oh, I thought not... they did a version of no, it of the play no, where. No, oh, okay, no. okay. No, they were just like we called them head trips. They were just passages. I see. To let you know that the chief had this inner life and right. it had a take on what was going on. It was crazy, but it was also any. And he also thought he was really little. He had not been able to go help a friend and, and his dad had, right. you know, with the chief and mm-hmm. his dad had, you know, all of that stuff. I remember so, his, his trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the other thing those guys did was they put Billy Bivett's suicide back in the, back in the play because Dale Wasserman had taken it out and he had sent them a letter. I'm coming to see the play. I hear you've made some changes. I'll keep an open mind. But if you still have a Billy Bibba suicide in there, I'm going to pull the play. And I remember the director said, what do you think I should do? And I said, I don't see how you can take it out. And to his credit, he saw it and he said, you know, you're right. It does work. But having been in the play, other people are going, what are these guys talking about? But, you know, uh, uh, Billy Bibba suicide in was in our version of it. Yeah. No, yeah. it became it. It, it yeah. got then they went to New York and did it. And I did do it there there for a while. And then it got done in uh, Chicago. It became on ca- college campuses. It was like the most produced. Oh God! Play yeah. For a while, you know. It was, mm-hmm. it was, uh, you know and, and it was uh, before the movie came out that we did yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Saul Zan, they couldn't get funding, and finally Kirk turned it over to his son, and he got funding from Saul Zance in, mm-hmm. in uh, San Francisco, who had a record company there. The one, the one that. Uh, um, one of the guys from Creedence Carol Carol Revival has written songs about what a jerk he thought he was because he was a record company owner and you know the, the things that people do, but uh, but he was the one that put put the money up for the play and Gene Hackman turned it down. Wow! I had a I had a job in a play once that was I mean a movie that was basically kind of a glorified extra, but the director he he cast a guy who had more experience. But he told me, he says, I just, I want you to, to be on the set. You know, I, I, I really liked you, but I just didn't, wasn't ready to take a chance on you. So I was the cast, this, the part was the, the stud. I was lifting weights in the background of the scene that Gene had with this actress, you know. And, uh, and we had, so we had time to talk. And, and, uh, and, he, and about that, he said, uh, you know, he just thought, why, why would I want to do a movie with Michael Douglas producing? Wow. You know. Wow. So, uh, so anyway, that's how, you know, all that happened. And for me, the process of connecting into that inner, at that point, I was kind of living out by Sunset Beach in San Francisco in those dunes out there kind of hold up for the day. You know, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to deal with the times. I didn't know, you know, what was going on. I mean, I didn't know what was going on for me. Mm-hmm. I was still playing rugby and getting drunk and singing and, you know, but I, I and, but the, the process and getting involved with the actor's studio and really finding out about a, a lot of other things and stuff, it, it opened me up. And, and one of the things that started happening for me, uh, I had gotten back into running long distances and I started uh, writing songs or, you know, things would come to me in rhyme more like they did when I have something to say to my parents at Christmas time, you know, it was um, like what? Well, I mean, it's just more uh, a flow somehow, you know, form can sometimes constrict, but often form creatively, it actually can open people up because the form gives you some, you know, so the form is rhyming. You can get caught up, what's the next word that rhyme, you know, but you can also get into, well, what wants to happen here that's not right within the sort of left brain logical Mm -hmm. thinking process. Mm -hmm. And you come up with those paradoxes and things that are, express the wholeness which our right brain is pretty good at you know and is where our music where rhythm is you know so i was just at a i've been for the last four years the ambassador uh for this group called project lifesaver international it was started by a cop 25 years ago where he got you know just fed up with looking for people who wander with, I want to talk have, to you about this yeah, because yeah. this feeds into your general hospital role too. So tell us yeah, about Lifesaver. Yeah. So, and Life it came Saver. because of because of because of that role, you know, uh they got onto me and I had at that time I'd done a play about a called The Prodigal Father, about a dad with Alzheimer's. And then I I got this uh, uh part, which was really a wonderful experience. And uh um 
but and exploring you know what's going on cognitively and then have I've you been, had any yeah. firsthand experience with anyone with with alzheimer's or dementia yeah i've had i've had some but in particular for me when i was at, at williams uh, my roommate and i had the sort of the back um least desirable bedrooms in our paternity house, but it's because of right there where we had our motorcycles and we could, I was working on them. And my physics professor lived behind with his wife, who was an English professor. She didn't, she didn't uh, teach there. And they had this beautiful 14 year old daughter who would go to the bus every morning, you know, innocent and gorgeous, and, you know, and then that's left about a 10 or 11 year old daughter who would come and hang out with us and watch us. And she had, she was autistic. And I would have lemon drops. So I had this kind of peripheral lemon drop thing, you know, but there were times, and there's one time that I remember so vividly because I'm, I've got the carburetor back on and I'm looking for where, where's that damn screw that holds this together, you know, or that uh, nut, you know, and I'm looking around and looking around and I look up and she's looking at me like right through it, you know, and um, so uh, one spring weekend when we would all start drinking whiskey sours early, you know, to get a good start in the weekend. And uh, we were standing over the carcass of a broken jukebox that we decided would be easier to throw it off the balcony than carry it down the stairs. <laughs> and along comes this little girl with her mom, who I'd never met. You know, in those days, kids could wander neighborhoods safely. Um, mm -hmm. Or right. we didn't realize that they couldn't. I mean, there's from that too, I'm sure. But anyway. We used I to go said, out to play. Yeah, I, yes. Yeah, just be home by dinner, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 so she kind of particularly put her arm around her daughter. You know, she's not like other children. I walked off. And, and uh, uh, so that like Monday or Tuesday, I wrote her a letter because I just felt like I really needed to tell her. I'm that guy, you know. But actually, I want you to know, you know, what, what because, because there was something about that, you know, energetically. I, would, I wouldn't have had that word then, but there was something about that uh, aliveness hmm. of being there interacting with someone where there wasn't it wasn't a verbal thing it wasn't a you know direct and uh and she ended up writing a really um courageous book called the siege because in those days they said the reason kids were autistic those people who you know knew all the answers you know uh was because their parents were overly intellectual and cold and and she was, you know, she wrote this book to say, well, you know, um, that's, that, that's, that's what they say and could be. My husband's a, he had his PhD in physics and comparative religion. You know, I mean, it was, it was so Is that wrong. true? Is there really? No, no, no. no. They're, they're, they, no. In those days, they also thought that the brain, when you're born, your brain stops developing. So, uh, um, but that's not true at all. You know, we're we're sort of programmed in a way to look at faces, but then the faces we see as we're, you know, through all that time while the brain is developing and the prefrontal cortex doesn't start showing up until we're teenagers. It doesn't really get, you know, that's all our executive functioning. When we're young kids, we're we're in another world in a sense, you know, and uh, um, which is why cultures will try to program in the good things and also the control things and stuff, you know, that's, that's what goes on. Um, but anyway, so she ended up closing her book with that. She wrote and asked my permission, but she, she closed her book after this is all I've had to say and the doctors and everything. And I'm going to leave it with the words of somebody who just, you know, encountered my daughter in the world. So, you know, that, that all happened when I was teaching, you know, as I got out of college. But it, it, it had a formation for me of having that experience and then carrying it forward, you know. And also, one other thing, my dad was in the Detroit Rotary. He was pretty active in that. And one of the things they did was every year they would take all the kids from the, the school for crippled children, which is where they put all the retarded as they were called then and you know right. we, we, i'm not sure the language is really any better but it's an effort to try to right not not get locked into stuff but mm -hmm. they would get to go on the bablo boat which was this like three-tiered ferry boat that would leave downtown detroit and go across the detroit river which really isn't a river it's just a strait, but to to, to an island that was in canada because canada was the other side of the river and then uh, mm -hmm. And Bablo Island was, um, you know, it was a, an amusement park. 
it was kind of like the boys island in uh in pinocchio in a way you know what I mean? only, huh. only there weren't donkey ears and stuff but uh it was a you know it was a place that, that we it was a part of every summer kids in detroit went to baba but this was right. when the ripple kids and there were some of those kids that while they still didn't have hadn't differentiated with autism and 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 being you know retarded or slow low iq mm -hmm. you know they were all every, everything was lumped in along with uh, uh for a while asperger's i mean uh, mm -hmm. in germany there was a guy looking at young particularly young boys who were pretty smart but they didn't seem to get authority cues that was it <laughs> that was the diagnosis their brain in the in the womb they didn't figure out how to do authority cues so they so they were hopeless and you know and the the Nazis actually went to this guy and, and said, uh, okay, if you're saying some of these guys aren't as bad as we think they are, which ones? Wow. Kind of a Soviet choice, you know? Wow. And his, his thinking, he said, I don't know what uh, what the, exactly the relationship is with these people in upstate New York who are identifying kids as, as um, you know, uh, um, what's the word? I'm losing the word. As autistic. Mm -hmm. Because they're so sort of inward, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but maybe there's some kind of spectrum here. So at a certain time in the 90s, when the diagnostic handbook was being reviewed every 10 years, they look and say, well, let's look at these diagnoses we've decided are okay. And, uh, you know, how are we doing with it? So Asperger's became the kind of darling autism light. Uh, and I know about that because my, my son acquired an a, a, um, Asperger's diagnosis you know he got that label in the genius label real early and he's learned to kind of work with them and understand them and if you talk to him you'd, you'd kind of well i can see where he i can see where he but did, did, how, how how is his life is his life does he live a full life oh God. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe 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 too full maybe he's too been in full. bali for a few years you know my kids yeah. I have black mom. My first wife who passed was African American, and my my second wife, and so she's Maxwell's mom. And uh, but he, you know, he grew up with a white dad in a primarily white community. His older brother, one of my bonus kids, who came to live with us, mm -hmm. uh, Nan's nephew. His parents died when he was two, and her mother was raising. Him. So he, you know, it, it wasn't. It, um, but I, I, I think he's always. Um, he just didn't want to be a black man in America. He didn't want to live with the, um, the feeling of if a cop rolls up on him, what's he going to be dealing with or, or yeah. somebody else? And he had, you know, the, the world presented him with plenty of those things. And he had this mm -hmm. other quality, which is he pretty much say what was on his mind. So if you were being an asshole and he thought so, he'd let you know. You know? <laughs> and he's certainly, you know, his mommy says, I, he's going to get pulled over and he's going to jump out of the car and start, start explaining the Constitution. <laughs> you know, I say, well, are we raising him to, to to anticipate how the world's going to look at him? Are we raising him to show the world who he is? You know, and he's got both. And I've seen him mellow out really, you know, situations that made it, maybe it would have had you worried. But I've also learned in my lifetime now from the mm -hmm. time where I was, oh, the family of man is all coming together and and I'm playing a big part in it, you know. I've learned that, well, there's a whole lot of other things that were, uh, you know, under under the radar or my California lefty radar, you know. Uh, so um, just a second. Can you close that door? Can you close that door, Chris? Thank you. <laughs> so, all right. So wait, let's go back now because all right. I, we, we have to I, get to. I'm no good for sound bites. I, no, the, the, this is all. You're talking about listening. You're a great listener. <laughs> This, this is yeah. It, oh. it, 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 this is all fantastic, and I could I could listen to all of it. But if I don't get to some key things, people are going to kick me. So okay. so okay. So 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 you're doing theater. You not only do the original production in San Francisco of Cuckoo's Nest, but then you end up doing you make your New York stage debut doing it in New York, correct? Yeah. Yes. I, I've replaced an actor. They they. The producers had said to me, um, you know, if you ever want to go in the, San, in the New York production, they didn't offer it to me when they went to New York because I was doing it in San Francisco, you know, and I didn't I didn't say, well, you either take me or not, you know. So so I'd been down in L.A. for uh, about nine months or so uh, 
spent a lot of time in the actor's studio, took a couple of Lee Strasberg's master classes, did a wonderful. So now how do you, okay, so Max, how do you get into Lee Strasberg's master class? You oh, have, you no, just you sign, have, no, no, you sign up and pay. Well, I, I'd been doing Cuckoo's Nest for, for two well, years. Okay, so you, wonderful, you had, okay, yeah. A learning curve, you know, and yeah. I did a couple of movie parts. I got uh, my first line in the movie in Dirty Harry. What's you in were in Dirty Harry, and I think your first screen role, if I saw on IMDb, if it's correct, was Ironside. You had you had a, something. Yeah, I that came a little bit later, but right in that oh, time, okay. I was living mm-hmm. in San Francisco. Certain parts when they were shooting up there, different things they would cast. I got a, I did. So a now, film how of, did you get it? Did you have an agent? Would it? Would it? Yeah, there was you... a wonderful gal named Ann Bregner, really wonderful gal. She ran the Brebner Agency, it was kind of the the main agency in San Francisco. And uh, and she had, uh, you know, taken a, a liking to me. She saw that something, you know, so she um, so when they called her and said, we want to get three actors to 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 accost Clint Eastwood because he's traveling through this tunnel. And we thought, let's give him another chance to bring out his gun. So I was one of three actors that she sent over. So I got my, you know, other actors had spent you know, we're spending years trying to get that first SAG part so they could yeah. tap Hartley into the union. So, and, uh, and then I got cast in a organization, which was um, the second Mr. Tibbs movie with, mm-hmm. with uh, Sydney Poitier. Sydney Poitier and Barbara mm-hmm. Panaris, his wife. And uh, it featured a bunch of, um, you know, young kids who took on the organization. And so it was Ron O'Neill was in there. Wow. Uh, uh Raul Julia that's when I'm wow. friends with Raul uh that we you know what a, what a guy he was gone too early that's for sure um mm-hmm. so uh and it was uh ended up the part got it was supposed to be the driver in the big chase scene this guy said I talked Steve McQueen into doing bullet and then they fired me and now I want to prove that I can do a chase scene better than bullet and better than French connection and I want you to be the driver. And they, he got so far behind in the first month of the movie, the producers came up and he asked that all out. And, and, and it was about a two, two block chase. Scene, you know? Wow. And, and Sydney's, you know, pulling the gun and I'm like, you know, <laughs> but you know, I had a, I had dinner with him at a, at a fundraising event one time at somebody's house. Oh, I can't even imagine. Flight. Was he as magical as he as and I imagined? Totally. He was. Oh, Max. Oh, yeah. So good to see you again. Yeah, that was. I loved your reaction. You had, you know, when <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, he treated me like I was a co-star of the the movie, you know. And we had a great talk about having biracial children. Ah. How you, how you um, are with it, you know. We were reversed. His wife was white, you know, and so, but. Um, you know, a good, a good um, connection with class, just true class. You know, and, um, that's what uh, I was just starting to ask yeah. you. He he just yeah. struck struck me as being almost angelic, being almost on a different plane of human. Um, yeah, but he had. To, I mean, he was he obviously could handle himself when you were with him. You knew that this was a guy. Who, it wasn't, you know, don't hurt me. It wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, I had come. Uh, uh, so I, then I came back from San Francisco. I mean, from New York to re- another thing that happened in there. Jerry Ragney, who was one of the writers of Hair. 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 And he had seen Cuckoo's Nest. And he, I, I come out to New York one time because I was seeing somebody who'd come through with the traveling uh, company of of company you know anyway and he said oh man i saw you know you got to read for this play i'm producing this play called small craft warnings and so i had the experience of going in and reading and and, and tennessee williams got in a big argument with his director you know tennessee so he breaks my heart and the director said see all the characters can't break your heart and he's going why not i wrote him now you know and it was i'm going like you know, in the end, I didn't get cast, but I had that, you know, I had that growing experience when I was there. I did a bunch of commercials. Wait, was did, it easy you know, for you, Max? We, we, did you ever have to take a day job? Well, I did a bunch of commercials. That was well, yeah, that's not yeah, a day yeah, job. Yeah. That's being well, an no, actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, these things just 
just opened up for me. And, uh, and, uh, and I was, you know, I'd, I'd been schooled to, uh, to appreciate it. Maybe, maybe not fully appreciate. I mean, I, I understand my luck more now <laughs> looking yeah. back yeah. than I did then, you know, because there, I had something, you know, I had some kind of feel for it and, Oh, I think, hell um, yeah. You, know, you added, have some kind of feel you know, for trouble. it. Um, but um, uh, then I came back to read for a part in Day of the Locust, which I didn't get. Wow, another that was a great film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, another another one, of the, you know, where the, the, the director was, you know, I said, what is the, you know, so I just, you know, I... They cast a guy who was a wonderful actor and had been with the actor's studio for years and stuff, you know. So, uh, but I started, I bootlegged into a place out at the Malibu Colony and I started running long distances on the beach. I ran the mile and half mile in high school because I wasn't fast enough in my high school to do the sprints or the hurdles, you know. So I wanted to get a letter. So that's what I did, but I never ran any over distance, but I started running, you know, like 10 miles at a time. And things started coming to me, processing my own kind of, you know, I'd grown up in this generic Protestant church. I got senior year sort of involved with Catholicism in a way because I, my girlfriend was from this big, happy Catholic family and my family wasn't so happy at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, the, none of those churches had anything to say about Vietnam or civil rights or girls that I found <laughs> helpful at all. You know? <laughs> So then I went to science and then I went, you know, some years with Carl Jung and, you know, I was on this exploratory kind of trip. I, you know, I didn't think of it as exploring. I, it was more like trying to find my way in the woods, you know, mm -hmm. and I started having these songs come to me that became, I call it my, my breadcrumbs in the cosmic forest, you know, that were just, um, you know, pretty, um, you know, all, all rhyme. I, I, what was, what kind of music coming. was it? I, I get that well, the lyrics rhyme, but what kind of, what was the genre well, of the, the music? First, I mean, I remember one of the first ones was about creativity, do something beautiful. And I went out, uh, I walked out of the colony was this wonderful kind of open walkway. I don't know if you've ever been in Malibu colony, you know, but it was, mm -hmm. people could walk around there like it was the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, hey, do you know anybody that's got a piano? Yeah, Jane has a piano on her porch right there. I'm knock on the door. Can I can I sit down at your piano for a few minutes? You know, and and um, this um, I mean, if it's helpful to this conversation, I could share what those words were because I remember. Yes, them. please. It was uh, do something beautiful. That's all I want to do. It's not something you own. It does not own you. Mm -hmm. Among the places you may go and the people you may know, it's in the living that happens when you go with the flow. Do something beautiful. That's what I know I'm here for. Although it ain't much, I know there ain't much more. It's not something you win, like winning a race. It's you and your life meeting face to face. I mean, I'm, this is coming to me, you know, I'm, I'm and now I'm and, and you're, you're getting a lot of love, by the way, while you're saying those words. <laughs> okay. And now what kind of music is this? Well, let me, well, to? I'll finish it. And then I'll okay, go ahead. Okay. So then, uh, then it goes, do something kind of shifts. When I got to the music, I saw oh, here, I was just going, you know, one, four, one, four, one, four, one, four, for two verses. I go, oh, so I go up to, 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 to two five you know so different you know like i like i've raised it you know but so, so to do something beautiful makes me feel so good seemed like so long i didn't know that i could and one day i knew i could breathe in a breath breathe it out in a way that would save me from death by seeing around me in each and any minute it's a beautiful world and we're born to breathe in it Aww. remember this was we'd been through the assassinations and vietnam you know if beauty you see and beauty you feel, then beauty will be and it will be real. Do something beautiful. That's how I'll survive. It's the beauty in life that makes it alive. And doing is freeing yourself from your head to be a giving being instead of a living dead. Do something beautiful. The one chance I see my life will have some meaning for me. The one mark that counts of the many I may make and the care that I give and the care that I take. Do something beautiful. So for me, that was like, this is what I want to do. It's not about what do I want to be when I grow up or something. It's not about anything. It's just like, I just want to do that. So the music, you know, I just kind of do, you know, beautiful. Then I got that third verse. And uh, uh, by seeing around me, I started going through the circle of fifths, you know, 
in each and any minute. It's a beautiful world and we're born to breathe in it. If beauty you see, and, you know, and it's, and it had a kind of a, a country bluesy beat, you know, that kind of is pretty much what I have in my butt. It's got a little bit of second line, a little bit, you know, uh, um, I don't want to make um, you uncomfortable, but I just want to tell you that Lauren Gold of the keyboard player for the who is here freaking out about oh. you and saying, when am I having a dinner party and inviting the two of you? So oh, uh, he's, that would be he's, great. He's a huge fan. So we'll, we'll have to great. make that happen. Yeah. You know, he might, you know, and same with Snuppy, you know, for the last three years or more, maybe now, I think it's more now. I've been going on Monday mornings to this thing that started about eight or 10 people around a table. Stop it. Cause Are Michael Boddicker is in your group, isn't he? Yes. Michael's a very old, good friend to Snuffies, oh, by the way. Oh, I love that guy. <laughs> I love that guy. Yeah. I have and a- So tell, tell us about your Monday group. Oh, well, it's uh, Richard Gibbs started it. Richard, uh, and there's a bit of a Berkeley School of Music sort of mafia and the leadership, the activation energy. Mm -hmm. And they, I met them because I was going to this technology group called Metal Media Entertainment and Technology Alliance that he, he started showing up. We would ride in together from Malibu. Then he started this, or he had already doing it on a smaller scale, but it just began to grow. So now we're meeting across the pier at a place that's now called um, uh, Dreamland. It's been, a, it's been a music and bar venue for years, you know way back when I first got Barney Miller, my girlfriend at the time did a mural for whatever oh, the wow. bar was called then cafe Malibu or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, uh, but it's a wonderful, uh, um, spread of age from people that have been around for a while, like Richard and, 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 uh, and Michael, um, a gen more generous than is in the industry, uh, um, encouraged, um, uh, participation from women because you know how showbiz is and has been and, you know yes it's getting better but it's still not there yet you know so and uh and uh and that age spread and and um and just just creatively generous group and now they're in a venue that's got really good music venues so they're in addition to always an interesting conversation going on and a wonderful group of people uh, uh, presenting about music or other things sometimes, but then there's some really good, good players. Sometimes people that have been around, and sometimes people coming out of the Berkeley School of Music who are really got something going. You know? So, uh, so, so anyway, that's a that's an open invitation. Actually, anybody that wants to come to that can can come, and they're on Zoom. Actually, you can you can Google composers Breakfast Club and sign up for that because you, that's what you have to do to get your name under your face if you're zooming in so How anyway fantastic. That, that. i used to have a literary salon in my home before covid called women who write and people used to come and play and snuffy played that's how we met uh -huh. and um com musicians and writers yeah. would come and it, it's wonderful you have this energy to do this and i also saw that you know you were on saturday night live sometimes and yeah but i kept up ending or... up on the floor you know I, yeah i did a thing with philly crystal the first time he did buddy young jr but yeah every uh -huh. time i would get featured i would end up on the floor but you know i got uh -huh. my card so there was uh -huh. that oh well, yeah yeah but no, uh, you know, you're not in that circle without you know having a sense of what's going on but okay, so so we gotta we gotta get to it. I know we have to okay. be careful yeah. how we yeah. talk about it. But All how right. did how did you hear? Okay, Barney Miller. There there are no VCRs. There's no streaming. I never missed that show, and I'm sure uh -huh. there are many people on this thread that will say the same thing. Iconic television, just yeah. one of the greatest sitcoms that has ever yeah. been. Did you know? All right, how'd you how'd you get cast? How did all that right, happen? So I had I had played a part in a in a TV show called the Paul Sand Show. Paul came out of Story Theater. Sure, theater. he played a, 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 a symphony. Paul Sand was the great impro improvisation guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve Steve uh, Landisberg was in that. He played a violinist. And I got hired to play a bully in a theater that Paul Stanton <laughs> shushes, you know, and then I, uh, you know, what are you talking about or something? I'm, I'm, I'm the bully. <clears throat> and I remember that particularly because Jim was Jim Brooks and his partner. I mean, those wow. guys, you know, 
And I remember because his partner had the theory that I did, his understanding of bullies is they're just bullies. Okay. My understanding of bullies is they're insecure. Ah. You know, and and so uh I was getting these kind of two two things from him, you know, and I so I expressed it to Jim. I said, you know, I just I just feel like guys like this, you know, they're they're really in concert in, in, insecure. He's probably wishing he hadn't said he hadn't said anything, but but he did. And now that pencil neck is calling him on it. <laughs> and he's supposed to, you know, he's supposed to have something to say and he doesn't, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And he just said, you know, Q. Just, just keep, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, you know, work it out with his partner, and he said, just, just keep doing what you're doing. So, but, and, and it turned out that Danny had seen that, and so he called me in, uh, and he called me in because he had done the pilot once. It was the original idea was half at home with Barney Miller and his family, uh, and half in the squad room, and a guy uh, actor named Charlie Haig had played this part of Kaczynski. Charlie Haig was on NYPD Blue, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes, mm-hmm. yes. So, uh, and it was, you know, kind of a Polish joke, and I guess you could say how we were having dinner recently and and talking with somebody, and he said, you know, originally it was, you know, he, he sort of called it that way, you know. Early on in things, it takes a while for people to find the nuance and dimensions of the characters and the writers to get beyond the broad strokes. Right. right. You, see, you see somebody start a painting and first they paint all black and then a whole bunch of blue and everything in the end. That's you hardly see that. It's all right with other stuff, but it's part of the process. So uh, but anyway, Danny, he told me sitting there with his leather jacket and his big curly hair and his big head and his big shoulders. And he didn't he didn't really say anything about that. He said, I had this thing cast. The guy's not available. You're really not much like him. And so uh, what what do you want to read or you know and I, I i just was i felt so comfortable with the realness uh, of the way he was talking to me instead of the casting director you know like acting like they really think that you're all that <laughs> and <laughs> bullshit really you. Don't, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just going through the motions you know but right. anyway and then he said you know you told me there's another way to do it and um and they offered me to part, they wanted me to shine, sign a nine month option. Well, I was gonna take the money from doing the pilot, it was a two episode pilot, and go up to Big Sur. I knew a place up in Big Sur because I used to drive through there on my way back to San Francisco. And and I knew this place that had a, it was the, ba- the kind of basement floor of a big house. So the deck of the big house and looked out over through the oaks, down to the ocean, had a futon, it had an upright piano that had a great sound. And that was it. But I knew it was available to rent. And I thought, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to go up and I'm just going to, you know, run the hills and and sit at the piano and write songs or whatever, you know. So I had to take a cut in the offer to not sign a nine month option because he was he didn't want to lose somebody. You weren't going to sign the nine month option because you were going to go up to Big Sur and write music. Yeah. Wow. That's balls. And they well. (laughs) You know, but that's what was, you know, so far TV was like getting parts of it's the secondary bad guy and get Kristen Love. I mean, get Chris, she was a beautiful gal. She was a fun actress, but it was like, you know, it was not, it was not what had been there for me doing Cuckoo's Nest. And, yeah. you know, uh, um, yeah. And it was like, okay, I'll play bad guys until maybe I, you know, even the, even the audition came from my agents. Sandy Bressler, you know, I said, you know, well, you got this call to come in. It's a cop show, but it's a comedy. He said it like that. And like, I don't know if you want to waste your time because it's a comedy. You know, and like that one I want to go on. H- had you had you done comedy to that point? Not not really. I really hadn't done anything. I had a walk online in our class play, Annie, get your gun. But I was class president. I was steered it that we did a play which anybody in the class that wanted to get <laughs> get a part could have a part instead of the four or five people that wanted to powder their hair and play old people, you know, <laughs> they were the usual suspects, you know. But I, when I went, when, while we were growing up, and for me, it was fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, our family went down to Delray Beach, Florida. My mother had lived there some as a youngster. She just got tired of kids having colds all winter and, you know, the, by the time I get the last kid in a snowsuit, the first one's coming back in. 
So she convinced my dad and they found a home that was over kind of on the very last part of the town of Delray uh, before it became, there would be a marker that would pass that road was colored town. You know, wow. and then beyond that, where you, if you were not white, you that you better be there by sundown. Wow. And uh, and then out beyond that were the various farms and ranches, which had like red, redneck foremen and Hispanic Cuban and other, you know, people working who are mostly who went to the the school I went to. Uh, the elementary school was down down the way from us. So so all of that was a really interesting uh, uh, change. But in so fifth grade, I was way ahead of kids with schooling and stuff, you know. So when I came back in, in fifth grade and I showed up and they were having their class president elections and I was elected, you know, and I, I um, but the teacher came and they were doing a play for the whole school that was about, uh, uh, what was it, duck and dive, you know, it was about about the, uh, you know, air, air siren, air sirens going off. And there was a part that nobody oh, wanted. Oh, duck and cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, duck and cover. Thank you. Right. Uh, uh, and there was a part of it. Nobody in the class wanted to play it because he was a big know-it-all, big, you know. And uh, But then when the when the sirens started going off, he started running around screaming and he totally lost it, you know. So that was, so she said, you know, I, you got to play this part for me because nobody else wants <laughs> play it you know and i i have this memory uh i just thought of a really strange metaphor for it maybe a, a, but anyway of as i started running around i heard this sound but it wasn't just a sound it was a feeling it was a vibration i said what is what is that what is that and after a couple of minutes i realized that's everybody in the audience laughing wow you know, laughing, but i knew it felt good you know it wow felt, well, you know, there was something, you know, so, I, you know, I, I mean, I didn't carry that with me. Boy, I always remembered that. Right, so, right, right. I've always loved to share jokes and, and laugh. And, and uh, you know, my my friend Wavy Gravy has a saying that I. Wavy Gravy. You know, say, when, you, when you lose when you lose your sense of humor, it's just not funny anymore. <laughs> you know? So, you know, my mother had lots of wonderful humor. My dad, you know, I. I it's not like, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, it was strange for me. But when I, when I think about what that feeling is, because there is something, you know, when, when, it's, when the writing's really good and you're not just, you know, getting the, the effect of a punchline, but there's something within, I have a friend who's a wonderful masseuse, you know, who can just sort of touch your shoulder and it's like, wow, that, yeah, that's it, you know. Did you and just, her, did you just kind of, did you know right away how to, were you just, woe, I mean, did you, did you just feel it? Did you just know no. it? Did you just embody it? No, no. no I you grew, still you grew it. into I would, it? I chewed, I, on the reading, I chewed gum. I was very broad. I just threw myself into, hey, oh, <laughs> I don't know what that is when people, when, you know, we all have our own little amounts of it. But with some people, particularly guys, particularly some of these big guys who can't express, there's a kind of a way, uh, you know, so I was just doing that. And I, and I chewed gum through the first, most of the first half season. I was very, it was oh, wow. And there are still people that go, hi, why, that's the guy that chewed gum all the time, you know, I think. <laughs> only for, and, uh, and uh, you know, Hal was one of the people that just kind of encouraged me to let it go, you know. He, um, but, uh, but also it was, um, you know, in the, in the pilot, you know, and one of them, Wojo, well, for one thing, he, he, I, I don't know. Wait, how, they, how did they get you? Here. So if you wouldn't sign the nine month, how well, did they, they get they, you? To... They said, you know, okay, you, you can have a 30 day, uh, hold, but mm -hmm. instead of nobody was getting paid much that the, the, the network yeah. didn't have it. A big, but we're not going to do film. Danny had done My World and Welcome to It. You know, he he was a multi-camera film guy. He was great at it. He had pioneered a whole. You know, anyway, he he, uh, you know, so um, so I just it was just less money. You know, uh, uh, but I did it, and then it got picked up while we were still shooting the second one. Uh, but you know, Wojo was in a thing. I, well, how come I don't get to go on a stakeout? We did one of the few 
episodes that actually went to another set, you know, and uh, uh, so, okay, you can come, okay, I it comes up with a trunk, I got bazookas, I mean, it was, it was, uh, I was uh, uh, trying to think, now, now it's been picked up, what am I going to do? I, I, I'm not sure what to do, I, I like some of it, but I, I don't, I don't, there's something I don't understand, or I don't get it, and I, I went down to to uh, Yucatan with a friend of mine who was uh, I knew from playing rugby and he was in a, a, a similar kind of place of do I take this step which looks like it's a really big step but at the same time it's kind of not the step I was getting ready to take you know and uh, wow and I, re I remember he was talking about something and he had a moment he was a, a bigger than life guy he had a moment like a Tevyev moment remember Tevyev and fiddle around the roof tradition oh, yes. my daughter on the one hand, on the other hand, tradition. On the other hand, there is no yeah. other hand. I was in yeah, Fiddler a yeah, few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it gave me, I say, I know, I, I if, if, if Wojo just, he has so much respect for Barney. He knows where he may not have a lot of detail on it, but he knows there's something about Pole and, you know, Hitler and those times and Jews. He doesn't really know because he hasn't really been around a lot of Jews. You know what I mean? He's raised up. I mean, whatever, that there's something there that, that his, his desire to uh, learn. And, you know, and then, and then the other thing was they had a, wrote early on, uh, Wojo arrests a guy in the park because he's got an American flag sewn on his butt. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's illegal, actually. Mm -hmm. But that was it was a new decision by the Supreme Court, and he wasn't supposed to be doing that, and he wouldn't let the guy sit down because the flag was on mm -hmm. his butt, you know. But while he's doing it, he's like ostensibly mad. But you know, there's that thing that uh, underneath uh, uh, anger is a hurt, and underneath or, the hurt or is fear, an, an unmet yeah, yeah. need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and um, so you know, for me, it was like Wojo. Uh, you know, he had, I never made a specific decision about um, Wojo's actual experience. I, it, it sort of rhymed with the decision of vets I knew I was what their experience was, you know, that were dealing more with wounded than with wounding. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, but I, I just, I, I, I played it like he, you know, the, the emotional part of the thinking of the people that it hurt mm -hmm. broke, broke through on him. That's how I approached it. You know, that, that, that feeling stronger is voice wa wavering. I mean, you, you don't get there by, well, I'm not going to waver my voice here. I mean, right. some people can act that way and be incredibly effective, but I, that wasn't even, the approach I wanted to, you know, I was, I was not in that school of, you know, but it was, it was not hard to go like, you know, what do you, what do you do? You know? And, and then that would influence the writing. You go, well, we didn't expect him to do that because Charlie Hayde probably would not have done that with it. <laughs> right? I mean, right. Charlie's wonderful, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's, he's got a whole other set of physicality and being and right. life experiences and grew up in New York and, you know, I don't, I, I, I see that's, that's, that's not so much in his toolkit. Right. But I played a guy for two years in San Francisco and another year and, you know, that, you know, cried several times a night. I was, I was having to, to really learn, you know, so don't go for that as a result. You know, it's there. You know, it will happen if you go at it right, you know, to, to whatever degree it's, it should happen, but it's not, uh, because we all have pretty good bullshit detectors that can tell us somebody's crying on purpose mm -hmm. in life. You know, this is all <laughs> goes back to that whole listening <laughs> sensitivity thing that you have. So, mm -hmm. did you did you guys? I mean, one of the most amazing ensembles that's ever been assembled. Did you guys click right away? Did it take time for you to find your group? It took a little time. They replaced some people from the pilot. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a while, the stuff at home would never really work. It was kind of like Danny Thomas it was kind of mm. like TV. So it took a while. I mean, the first thing we did when we came back, uh, although Ron Glass was in there, as opposed to Ron Perry, who had done the pilot, you know, there were some changes there, but 
uh, the first thing we did was that original pilot. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to kind of pretty step in the footsteps of what Charlie had laid there. I felt this is somehow I got to hit those notes, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but uh, but that thing of looking and exploring, like what's what's in this? We're supposed to really be cops. You know, there was a thing that w w w Wojo comes in on this part, one of the second episode of the pilot. He comes in and does a bunch of karate moves and ends up in front of fish, you know, and then fish says, is that necessary? <laughs> and uh, and uh, Yamana has a line about a man who could kill you with his thumb. And so he's supposed to know karate. You know, I said to Danny, I, I need to get a little time off, man. I got to learn some karate. I don't know anything about it. Oh, well, they just they just kind of go around like this and they shout at each other. You know, <laughs> he's coming because he's he is a comedy guy. I said, you know. If it, if this was a skit, there was no Saturday Night Live at the time, so there was mm -hmm. no John Belushi to point to or anything, you know. And I mean, it was like, but if we're really supposed to be cops, and he really is a Marine who could kill you with his thumb, I should get some kind of help with it. And so he went. You hired, got that Lee Strasberg thing going on there. Well, you know, I mean, it's really just common sense. You yeah, know, you're going to come in and do this. What are you going to do? You know. Mm -hmm. He went and got the the number one guy, this big Hawaiian guy, his name escapes me right now, and then started arguing. So you guys yell things at each other, right? Well, not not really, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Arnold. You know, he says, Well, you sure? It sounds like it, you know. He taught me a, you know, a couple of things. I was fairly limber at the time and stuff like that. But when I see it, because Danny then took it and made it part of the opening credits. So, you know, it's like every time I see it, I go. Oh, there's so much I could have done with that if I just, you know, had an idea how. But, uh, you know, uh, as as we all learn, you, you know, these, these things, these sort of debriefings of our adventures are are worthwhile. But we also have to let it go <laughs> because we can't we can't change uh, whatever's gone down before. You know? So I imagine so how soon did your life start? Did you know? All right. At what point did you know? OK. I'm in a hit show. This is this. I, is, I got this it is, pretty quick. I got yeah. I got I got that. I went, you know, when the audience starts, audiences started showing up because they showed the first half, you know, so now they're they're ready to laugh. As a matter of fact, the reason we eventually got rid of the audience because they laughed too easy. <laughs> a lot of the writing was, you know, funny, 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 and then payoff, you know, I, I mean, there was, a, you know, and often Danny wasn't really finished with how is he going to wrap all this up. So we do it in front of the audience and then and then we send them home and we start back in. And finally, I said, well, let's just not have an audience. Let's let the camera crew laugh and stuff. So they're not laughing at the punchline. They're laughing at what's going on in that particular take of that scene, you know, and right. and. Uh, and then I would sweeten it a little bit. This old guy, Homer, a wonderful film editor. So it, it wasn't that slamming laughter. And, and uh, But I, I think, um, you know, we were never a better than number 10, I think. We were always in that, you know, we were. Is that uh, true? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It became a big success in the reruns in the, mm -hmm. those, um, what do they call it? Primetime access times 7 to 8 and mm -hmm. 11 to 1130, where the network has to yield back to the local stations so the ones that don't have news have reruns mm -hmm. took off or you know found a whole audience of people who didn't want to watch network tv you know be there you know <laughs> that whole way they, 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 the, the promos they used to have us do they were just so freaking corny and lame you know because they just didn't get um get that but uh you know i knew it was something that that i was enjoying doing you know i was gonna say so did you did you guys love each other did you enjoy each other was it a fun was going to work fun we were like a family so mm -hmm. not everybody was getting along with everybody all at the time right not everybody and there were some adoption it was a mixed family you know so like greg sierra had you know made a great mark for himself on uh, on um what was it sanford and son i think you know mm -hmm. so he had to deal with the network to do his own show Mm -hmm. Well, they said, well, we don't quite have that that going uh, uh, yet. So we want you to get into Barney Miller and play Chano. And I also wanted to keep using the accent. And Gregory was eager to do something without the accent because mm -hmm. he'd done a lot of Shakespeare. He did not have an accent mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. You know, people said, oh, the accent, that accent is funny, you know. 
and and they kind of um you know uh i would say jerked them around a little bit i mean mm-hmm. they're trying to find the space and you know they, they've got their jobs to do but um uh and um hal uh one time in an interview somebody asked him you know well what about you're putting people in jail how do you feel about that you know kind of coming at it from that you know and he said he said, oh, no, we take it very, very seriously that we are, you know, locking people up. You know, we don't, uh, that's what police do. You know, I said, you know, as a matter of fact, one of our uh, cast members has been in prison. Well, uh, that was not something that that, um, you know, Gregory was sure that everybody would know or find out who it was. And that was him. It was he. The English teacher and me, you know, uh, and and he uh, and and he felt it was intentional. Oh, and he just announced, "I'm not going to have any further dealings. I will not talk to Mister." Oh, Ow. you know, so we did about three shows that way, you know, and finally there we had a scene where I was in the middle. And because people would say, Noam Pitlick was the director for those shows because he was such a great peacemaker and, you know, lover of all mankind. And and um, and so, you know, uh, well, you have to talk to, you know, well, you tell Mr. Linden that if I step over here at this time, Benny, well, you tell me. Huh? Oh. And I, would, I was in the middle of it. So I I kind of just pushed it until it until they finally did start talking to each other, you know, and then. Danny came down and took them up to the office and gave them a talking to. And so it was cordial after that, you know, and I think, um, I don't think Hal did anything intentionally at all. You know, uh, you know, we're all, we're all tone deaf at times. So maybe it was a mistake, but uh, uh, at the same time, I think Gregory had, um, you know, had a lot of uh, times where people didn't honor their word to him and, and, uh, you know, he'd come through some stuff. So maybe he was a little on the, you know, a little, little ready, ready, ready to see it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, I mean, there were, there were some things like that, but we, there wasn't, there wasn't um, ego stuff. And certainly Hal has a lot to do with that because he never went like, I mean, he was the straight guy in a lot of it. I mean, and he, you know, he can get laughs and laughs are fun to get, but mm-hmm. there was a need, you know, and, in those late hours when we get the last of the script and we put it on its feet and stuff. And especially sometimes Abe and, and Jack would be really tired and everything, but Hal from that wonderful experience he'd had as a, as a, as a musician and with big bands and then doing musical um, comedy, you know, so where, where timing and rhythm is important in comedy, but it's also, I mean, you know, he, he could hold that center uh, and keep it from kind of wandering off because as I'm, I'm sure you know, sometimes, you know, just somebody makes a mistake late at night and then that compounds somebody and now somebody else makes another mistake and then somebody over mm-hmm. here and pretty soon that one little mistake, you know. I, I have to, uh, can I tell you my my very short Hal Linden story? So my father, I'm not unlike your father, my father was a Borschbelt uh, MC and singer uh-huh. and, and he uh-huh. would in- introduce the talent, but he... Uh-huh. Um, introduced Hal Linden at the Yiddish theater and they sang to, they sang and and did a oh, show cool. together so yeah. and Hal was just lovely to my father who this yeah. segues to the next thing who um, ended up ha- getting Alzheimer's and we'll talk about that oh, in wow. another yeah. sec but um but my other story is that Steve Landisberg lived across the street from Maxwell's Plum, uh-huh. where I worked as a waitress out of college, and uh-huh. Steve was a regular customer of mine, and he was the loveliest. He would come yeah. in by himself and sit down and have a uh-huh. lovely dinner, and he was a uh-huh. wonderful tipper, and he was very funny and very yeah. lovely and very yeah. conversational, yeah. and he was just a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, yeah, really smart. He he was yeah, you know, he was like Gregory Peck. Ooh. He could do Gregory Peck. I mean, he wow. could do. I mean, he had a great Gregory Peck voice that he could do, but I mean, in a way, he had that about him. He didn't have that look, you know. No. But but he but he had that about him, and he and he really took in people, and who they were, and what it was they were saying, mm. what they had to say, you know. And it wasn't like because I'm trying to be the greatest guy in the world. It's just it's just just how he was, yeah. 
So, you know, I promised you an hour. We've already gone over, but I, I, I can't let you go without talking about two more things. So, so when Barney Miller ended. I'm having a great time, by the way. I'm getting, I'm to, so, tell, I'm getting to start talk through things that, uh, that I've sort of been thinking through lately, just trying to get my perspective on now. So you let me run on and. Uh, oh, no, really uh, we're, we're loving it. We're loving it, loving. I'm loving it. And All you're right. getting a lot of All love. Right. So, All right. so. So when Barney Miller ended, wh- what is that like for you? You're on this hit show. Uh-huh. Well, not number one, which I'm shocked. I did not know. Uh-huh. I didn't even know yeah. that. Um, yeah. wh- what's your move right after that? What are um, you thinking? What do you want after that? I, I was kind of um, eager to, to do uh, something else. Mm-hmm. By, by mess- I'm reaching up to push the message off, covering up your face. <laughs> I forgot to turn off my notifications. Uh, um, uh, so I, I guess I was, I was kind of eager to work, um, and stuff was coming at me. A lot of it seemed like um, it was sort of another Wojo type thing. Mm, of course. Uh, so I didn't. They weren't. They weren't direct offers, but they were offers to come in and read. And uh, but and there was one of those that you know uh, Craig Nelson went and took and just slammed it and, and uh, coach. coach you know I mean oh, he wow. it and it was a brilliant show uh, and you would have been great but, in that too I could see that you know I, I honestly I honestly uh, I I I don't know I mean you, you know hmm. I, I saw what he he did with it and uh, he was great uh, but you would have been know. great too yeah. but I see what I you're saying a, I did it I I got, for for one thing I got married. Uh, and, um, and I'd been, I'd gotten uh, kind of out of a relationship I'd been in for a long time with a, a, a wonderful gal, but it wasn't having me, but she's the one that connected me with Buffy St. Marie and the American Indian movement and stuff like that, which was a lifesaver for me. How so? Uh, around the time that I was getting, uh, you know, famous and and uh, and had enough money to buy drugs for me and my friends and do mm-hmm. what I might call it John Belushi because mm-hmm. I knew John when I was doing Cuckoo's in New York he was doing Lemmings down the street and I knew John and Chevy uh, a bit and I'd you know I'd seen Lemmings and stuff and and uh, but I but by connecting in with the um, people that I'd been watching did you know Lorraine uh, I had lunch with Lorraine on Saturday Lorraine Newman from that first cast. <clears throat> No, I, 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 I didn't know uh, her, but she read for the wife in, uh, in DC Cab. Uh, which was the next and, thing that you did after Barney Miller. Yeah, which, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did that film. I did. I, I realized that in film, I don't have much sense of the, of the, the pace and the, how things work with the film, having done DC Cab. You know, when, when to be ready, when's happening, when, when's your time to say something you know needs to be said about a scene you know mm-hmm. and uh <clears throat> so this thing came to me uh, uh called whiz kids and uh and it was uh about um five high school young high school kids mm-hmm. who were kind of brain brainiacs and and uh and the computers and they'd done it they'd done a pilot and each week the, and the idea of it was they would solve a crime that was caused by a subsidiary of a big corporation called NASCAR, you know, NASCAR. So there was this anti-corporate sort of vibe to it. <clears throat> and it was shot over in, um, uh, over there in where they shot ET, mm-hmm. you know, it was that kind of suburbs mm-hmm. and they had bikes and stuff. And they had a reporter that would go to when they could get needed to get to a little bit bigger computer. This was the laptops were not out yet. Right. And, uh, you know, but the guy that created the show had a show called Simon and Simon. It was a hit. Sure. He was into the Internet and stuff. They said, OK, they said he could, you know, I was on their list of starting with movie stars and stuff of people that he could reach out to <clears throat> because they wanted them to cast that. What was a young reporter as somebody more 40 as to be a demographic, you know, mm-hmm. so. I looked at it and I, my take was it's all kind of eighties stuff. What if this reporter is like, what if Ken Kesey decided, you know, to come down from Oregon and uh, you know, get a garden patch and just get involved again, which interestingly right around that time, he, he wrote a piece in uh, Rolling Stone that he was thinking of doing that, you know, just getting, so, 
But so we could have the 60s and the 80s kind of dialogue going on. And I at that point, you know, I'd started wearing a hairpiece for Barney Miller because mm -hmm. the, what was I was losing my hair would show up white. So they put shoe polish on it, you know, black <laughs> makeup. It would, you know, Steve did that, but he had enough hair. He couldn't tell, you know. Finally, I got this, you know, sort of bathing cap wig that um, let me just let my hair grow. <clears throat> so I wanted to, I want, didn't want to look this, anyway. Anyway, uh, but at the time, my wife, Willie, had gotten together with my best man and, and best friend, Merle Saunders, is a San Francisco musician, a keyboard player. He played with Miles. He played with Jerry Garcia all, all, a lot. Then they, they did all. There's still people playing the Keystone repertoire that, that Jerry and Merle, you know, because they kind of took jazz and rock and roll and blended them. And, and, and Merle um, got, we got some musicians together and, and we were recording a, a bunch of my songs really fast, like 18 songs in two weekends, you know. <laughs> Not to, you know. Wow. And, and uh, but, but Phil DeGuerre, when he heard that I was recording with Merle Saunders, Phil DeGuerre was a hopeless uh, Rolling, I mean, uh, 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 Grateful Dead groupie. You know, he just loved them. And he had the gig of producing the next Twilight Zone. And he wanted the Grateful Dead to do the music, but he couldn't get through to them because they had this whole screen. Anybody that was that way, you know, people could record their stuff. They were very open and approachable, but they did not tolerate that kind of fandom that that kind of uh where phil was at you know? right but he saw it and it did work out Mer merle uh, and, and, and son tony still gets some you know residuals from the the stuff they wrote on it you know but but he but but uh phil said yes to everything all my ideas but he didn't share any of them with the network or anything like that you know so it was a martinez was in it he played my brother-in-law i'm sorry we never really got to work on it because I was just, you know, I had a new baby and a new wife and she was having trouble. She got like her shape back. She was a wonderful athlete, but she just didn't feel good. And, and she even had a time when we were talking to her, she, she was the widow of a good friend of mine. That's how I knew her. He died of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And I would look in on her every so often. And one night I was saying good night and, you know, it's a different feeling and stuff, you know, so, so, um, uh, I remember her doctor who was his and, you know, Willie was a, was a black woman from, from rural and then ghetto Texas met her first husband. And he came through as a journalism student on freedom rights. He was the councilman for like seven terms down in South central, but wow. the, their marriage didn't last. And she married my friend who was an actor and then a sculptor. And, and um, uh, she, you know, we, we, we had this baby. There were, there were a number of signs in retrospect with what was going on, but I mm -hmm. signed on to do a, a one man play on Babe Ruth on, in, on Broadway. And we'd been rehearsing there and then it was time to go to New York and rehearse in the theater. And and uh, and on the night of the dress rehearsal, which was the sports writers, which was the greatest audience, because then those one man plays like Mark Twain, the act, the audience is acting with you. They're not just suspending disbelief. They're going, yep, you're Mark Twain. And I just laughed at your joke. I, you know, I'm 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 playing with you like you're Mark Twain. Yeah. Not like you and he believe you're Mark Twain, but I'm here just believing that, that this, you know, so. So uh, uh, anyway, she ended up going in the hospital that night and uh, I couldn't get her fever to break and stuff. And a few, a few uh, nights later, they said, we got to go in and we think her ovaries are infected. And they found this tumor that had caused her appendix to burst. And, and that was the beginning of what, um, what we, you know, uh, what they said you know, it's like going to be like two years. And we were like, you know, no, we're going to lick this. And, you know, the first, mostly a year, we were pretty positive, but time comes when it's happening again and stuff and you start realizing, okay, this is, this is where it's going, you know? And uh, so, um, you know, after that, I, I, um, I had this, you know, almost three-year-old to 
race. And uh, I remember going, I was riding in to, uh, to meet with, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was doing Quantum Leap, which I thought was a wonderful idea for a show. Um, Dan, oh. Oh. he had Ma Magnum PI on. Uh, anyway, you know, uh, uh, I had Indy in the back because the person who was going to watch the kindergarten thing had run too long and the person who was going to watch her head. And, you know, so I'm saying, you know, I, I got some coloring stuff and, you know, you might, I might have to go in the other room with this guy, but it'll be all right. You know, you'll be fine. It's, you know, and, and I pulled over a Malibu Canyon and there were no phones. And I realized I, I can't do an hour long episodic show. I don't have a nanny who's going to raise my kid, you know? Uh, and I drove back down to the first pay phone and called him and said, you know, I'm really honored. It's not like they were offering me the part yet. It was, right. have, let's have a conversation, you know, but I felt, I felt uh, pretty good about it. And it was, again, there was a case where somebody took it. Dan Belisario. Don Dan Belisario. Belisari. Don, Don Belisario. Belisari. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I can't say the name of the actor who played the part. He was wonderful. Uh, uh, um, it's, they'll, they'll tell us because I yeah, can't remember yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, you know, that's... Um, so I had those years where I uh, pretty much... A, a few times people kind of came and said, come on. And I did some things, you know, uh, but for the most part, I was just. How long just, a hiatus did you take, Max? Well, um, what happened was I had started seeing for a time I was spending time with Bonnie Raitt. And the wonderful thing about that was that I had this question about, OK, so I have a daughter who had a black mom. Now I hope she gets a mom you know i was sort of through the time of i was really i have to i have to grow i was in the consoling pleasures for a while you know i was seeing people but i was uh you know uh and i re had a kind of an epiphany that came scott through right sorry somebody just scott, wrote scott it. back no scott played the lead oh scott you played the lead no this oh this you're talking was, about the part that you were that you were up for yeah okay, the part gotcha. i was not for the lead yeah no okay. it was uh um Anyway, uh, uh, so you were keeping company with Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, it did help me go realize that no, because Bonnie's got kind of lives out there where it's it's not about black and white, which it's not. But there are things about life where it, it does raise its head, you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, but but I uh, I seen uh, um, somebody else, and Bonnie was in the space of making that wonderful album and kind of pulling her career and her life together and uh, working with Don was, and you know, that won, won five Grammys and it just, and I was clear to me, I got to, I can't be like going on the road or something. I, I got a, a, a daughter who needs to have her friends and stuff like that. Dean and, Stockwell. Uh, but, yeah. Dean Stockwell. Yes. <laughs> wonderful actor. But, uh, and so, but the time came, I was seeing somebody else. Mm-hmm. And the next thing she let me know that um, that my son Maxwell was on his way. She was, uh, it was, you know, kind of hard for her because I'd kind of gotten like, well, maybe I should just stop seeing everybody. But I kept seeing. And, um, uh, but for me, it was like, wow, the universe works really fast. Um, it was wonderful. And she's, you know, we've been separated for a long time certain amount of it was misunderstanding a certain amount of it was maybe we never had that that time by the way those tic tacs if you're hearing them are things landing from the palm tree onto the roof of where I'm <laughs> up in the porch no, we're not hearing them uh, uh, um, uh, it was a great beautiful blessing in life you know and had my son Maxwell and then her nephew, DeLondon, came to live with us. And then we had our daughter, Grace. And they're all, you know, grown and, and uh, have, have kids of their own now and, and stuff. Nine but grandchildren you have, yes. And nine grand. <laughs> my oldest grandson is with my oldest biological daughter, who was given up at birth for adoption because she was really pretty much a, from a one-night stand. I paid for the home for unwed mothers. And then I sort of left a trail. And eventually they changed the laws you know for a while a long time there it was very hard for people to find their birth parents 
or parents to find their child. And then they changed that and made it possible. And we've when, had a great- When did she find you? Uh, on the, well, she-, she How long ago? Of, uh, uh, about 23 or 24 years. Wait a minute, let me think. Yeah, about 23 years. Mm-hmm. She, um, on the eve of my dad's funeral, my youngest sister came up to me and said, I don't know if this is a good time, but I got a call from a woman who says she's your daughter. Wow. And, did you uh, know you had this daughter? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. I definitely knew her. As a matter of fact, my my first bonus daughter who calls me called me her bonus dad. But um, I met her at a Native American uh, Sundance and she was 14, you know, just turned 15. She was pregnant. She'd been out on the street because her dad threw her out because she was a rebellious teenager and she got pregnant and she was was too late to have an abortion and she didn't want to marry the dad because he was a big good looking jerk, which he was. And I just remember meeting her and her mom and thinking, God, I, I have a daughter that about this age out there somewhere, you know. So I kind of stepped in there mm. as um as um a surrogate her, her dad and 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 you know so I had my first grandchild now so in that relationship I'm a great grandparent because wow. that grandchild now has wow. grandchildren so uh, but um uh yeah I I um and then so then when I I did uh remarry and a a job came up with Frank Zappa's two oldest kids are we all yeah. right yeah Okay, with Frank's two oldest kids, Moon and Dweezil had an idea for a show that Moon used to say it's the Adams family. But the network uh, was um, was selling it as or saw it, I think, as uh, uh, that Dweezil was another Kurt Cameron, who was a teenage star who had kind of become the big, big star out of a family drama. Mm -hmm. And Moon was maybe along for the ride. You know, they didn't really Mm. get. and um, but I had seen Moon at a uh, at a couple of auditions that most of the other girls in reading were, you know, the ones that were told from Kansas, you've got to go be in the movies. You know what I mean? They were real sort of beautiful starlets and Moon had her own energy. And, and I could see that she she got that she wasn't that. Mm-hmm. And she was there to make her effort to get the part anyway. And mm-hmm. often I'd see her leaving, you know, with her head still held high and stuff. So. Good. I saw them. I saw them at a uh, some kind of a fundraiser for Michael Dukakis that Norman Lear put on, you know, and uh, and they actually approached me, but uh, uh, you know, and it, before they did, I said, you know, I got to tell you, Moon, I've seen you in these different circumstances, you know, and I, I just, I, I, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a fan of yours for that reason. I see how you are. I say, well, we are doing a show, and the dad in it is a as a scientist they they ended up changing it the network changed it to a writer but you know we we wonder if you'd be interested in playing the dad in this family and uh and i was and um you know it um it had a lot of problems in the the network's sort of attitude toward them and stuff uh, that um you know we need to get these kids to behave they really didn't have a sense of the zappa family which i, I spent some time with you know, that because it was up against the Cosbys. You know, in those days, you know, Bill Cosby was that Bill Cosby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and um, so, uh, you know, that part of it uh, didn't work so well. Uh, Roseanne, they were, Moon was talking to Roseanne and she said, I'll fire the bastards, you know. So they, they were, I, I was telling them, you know, what we have to do is take what they write and do something that gets what they're writing but does something more like what we're trying to make it be and then they'll write in that way we have to bring them along you know because they don't know mm-hmm. they don't really they don't you know and uh but it wasn't very uh pleasant it got worse and worse that the, the gal who was in the pilot played the mom i, I found out later she had found out she had cancer Oof. but she kept that quiet you know but they replaced her with cindy williams who's oh. brilliant in her way and all wonderful, you know, what I really love Cindy, you know, but it was a whole other way of going out now, you know, so we're, we're sort of 
throwing spaghetti at the wall sort of thing, you know, uh -huh. uh, trying to figure out rather than let's get down in here and see what it is we got, you know, that matters in the world and matters to us. And, and it's, it's bound to be funny because that's the nature of life, you know, but uh, so when that was over, I really felt like what made me think I wanted to go back to acting. I mean, I've changed television. It changed, you know, it was no longer the, the mixed diverse cast of the seventies. It was pretty mm -hmm. much gone to uh, uh, all white shows with maybe a black character and wow. then all black, all black shows on the Fox, on the urban channel. Right. You know, and you mentioned and to, that you had worked with Valerie Harper. What did you do with Valerie? I, I, with Valerie, I did a movie of the week where I played a, um, a pushy kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, out of uh, alignment boss mm -hmm. who was, uh, you know, was, was, uh, and I, as a matter of fact, at one point I, I, I grab her, uh, her blouse and I ended up scratching her with her fingernail and Valerie went to her grave with a little scar right there. From, oh. <laughs> from my she was a wonderful gal and Cliff yeah. DeYoung played the, you know, the young executive who was seeing the power structure, but didn't really want to make waves. And, uh, but eventually he did. Mm -hmm. The right choices were made. And therefore there was never a problem with that in Hollywood again, you know, <laughs> support. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, and I remember that uh, to get him out of the show, you know, out of the plot for a while, they sent him out to Hopi because there was a thing about the Hopi, you know, it, it made it into some awareness of, liberal life and all that you know but i kept campaigning i say you know if he if he if, when you spend time at hopi you get a whole other understanding of how to think about women mm -hmm. how and so well because it's a matriarchal culture as most native americans were you know uh, uh i mean in the Iroquois confederacy it's the clan mothers that would pick who would be presented to the clan to be the next leader if somebody died or you know, did something where, you know, gave up their crowns as they their uh, horns were a symbol of their their leap. So males had certain leadership roles to negotiate stuff with other males. But it was the clan mother. If a guy abused his position, the clan mother could just just, you know, impeach him. So and then with Hopi, it's very, you know, the, the earth and mother and just just a sense. It's it's it's, um, it's not like they're Amazons, but I just thought that would be an interesting thing that he has an experience there that he comes back with, but I was never able to make that, that pitch. So it's still in there. If it comes up, if the show like comes it. up, I like there's, still, it. there's still my thing. I, I wish we could have, you know, I thought it would have made a better show. Uh, we, but we've Valerie, been talking wow. for a long time, but I have to, before we go, I have to talk about this character, Mike, that you've played on General Hospital that, yeah. Uh, that earned you two Emmy awards that it, it, I, I was watching scenes from it today and having lived through it with my father and my yeah. mother-in-law and with a nun, yeah. I mean, you really, how did you get there? Is I, I started to ask you this earlier. Is yeah. this something that you've experienced firsthand with people? Or? I have had uh, friends that, you know, that, that, that became, you know, uh, they weren't uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but it's you know it's one of the forms of dementia. Mm -hmm. So I have had that experience, but uh, um, I also I did a play down in Hollywood called The Prodigal Father, written by a gay playwright about a gay playwright mm -hmm. who's from Tennessee, whose father you know his father was a like a church guy, but he really was at home in the woods. Mm. But this guy could never, his father, you know, there was the opening of the play was kind of a flashback scene where uh, we're both younger, but, and, and we've got a raccoon up in the tree and I'm just saying, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, you know, he can't do it. So that sets up, you know, now it's the eve of his first uh, real production of one of his plays. It's been very successful. While he's there at the play, his father shows up. He's got a roommate there. He's got his lover roommate. He's not at the opening for some reason. And and uh, and the father shows up, and he's he's got dementia. He's he and he knows it. He knows that there's something wrong. That he's mm -hmm. been kind of coming into 
focus and realizing that he's scared the shit out of somebody, maybe hurt somebody a little bit. He's, you know, that he's going to be a problem. I mean, he's come to ask his son to take him out before he does hurt somebody. Wow. That's, that's the story. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it gave me the time you get in a play to work on what is going on in those spaces and, and find that, you know. And, uh, and so I had that going in because it took a while for it to get clear that Mike was forgetting. And then there's, you know, denial and getting a diagnosis, you know, laughing it off and all that. But around the time I connected with uh, Project Lifesaver, uh, was when he was getting to that place. And I went through one of their trainings where they take people, they go out and do this with, with police and others, but they, they put a bunch, they put gloves on you. They put uh, glasses that kind of distort and narrow your vision. They put earphones on that have random conversations going on. Um, a heavy coat um, oh. to make you, you know, so you don't, you don't, you don't have your physical mobility. And then they have some stations around and they give you one time, they give you the assignment, go over here and put the red sweater in a blue suitcase, and then, then go over to station two and pick three yellow pills and two green pills. And, uh, you know, some things which you, you know, you've, you haven't even gotten it at first. You're trying to figure it out. You're doing that for, for, for 20 minutes or so, you know, and then you take all that off and go in a room and sit down with someone that's part of the workshop leader you know to go to help people talk through what was your experience what did that feel wow and uh and also there was a one of the panels there was a guy who had early onset alzheimer's and he was on the big screen because he wasn't there so i got to watch him on the big screen from the audience and that panel was about what's going on cognitively for people with with dementia and alzheimer's and stuff and i remember he was in, in his 50s and i remember him when he was talking, he's saying, so for me, things are, they are darkening a little more every day. I remember that moment, you know. So I, I had those things to, to work with and a wonderful um, crew and all that was very accepting, you know, because they count down, you know, they go, okay, five, four, three, two, silent one, and it's action. Well, I didn't want to just be going to, oh, I, now I'm going to put on my, I don't know what's going on face, you know, <laughs> I would get to where I didn't know where I was if it was that kind of scene or something, you know, but sometimes I had the first line, you know, <laughs> it count down and I'd be there trying to find it, trying to find it, you know, uh, but sometimes I couldn't, I just have to go, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. What was the line? You know, <laughs> but they, but, I, but, 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 but I, I think people got what I was doing, you know, I mean, I wasn't abusive with it or anything, but but trying to, I mean, as actors, at least in that approach to it, you are always looking to not really know what you're going to say next until it comes to you. I love course, that. You have to know. And you have to know where your mark is. I mean, you know, it's not. Okay, now, Max, you know. how the hell do you do a soap opera at this stage of life? I mean, it terrifies me. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't even attempt to try to start acting again because I don't think I could learn lines at this. How do you do soap operas? How do you do that at well, this stage well, of life? you know, uh, my character didn't have that many lines. And I mean, they're well, known to do 40 some, stuff. I there. saw you, know, you do some yeah, pretty yeah. hefty scenes. No, no, I, I worked pretty hard on it. Of working like what's going on here that leads him to, you know, be here and then suddenly he's thinks he's eight years old and he's got to be home or his mom's going to kill him. You know I mean? What, mm-hmm. what are the, what are the things that are said? What are the, where is he trying to be, trying to be emotional, mm-hmm. but what's going on underneath that pokes through when he tries to say something and tries to be, tries to tell what's his name is social worker, you know, tries to be kind of classy and say, you know, I hope you'll remember how much I wanted to remember you, but he, He's still in there. You know, he's not meaning to cry when he says that. He thinks mm-hmm. he's being cavalier, you know, or mm-hmm. charming or something, trying to, try, you know, to, to, to find those and, 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 and have them and, and have them together. And then with the subs, they go really fast. So you get there and you rehearse, which is basically the director laying out the shots that she's figured so that she can start the scene wide and move it into the close ups. And, you know, and sometimes, it's really not you work. You got to, you have a moment where you might say something, but you don't want to abuse it because they got a lot on their plate. 
Right. You know, and then you go get into makeup and stuff and then you come up and you run it for the camera guys who have been doing this forever. So they're, they're, they're pretty much on top of it. You know, you got another moment where you might find for yourself or with, with another actor, you know, this is where I'm going to blast you, you know, or something, you know, uh, and, and they are so good. Those, you know, they've been doing it for so long and they're so uh, accepting. I, you know, Mo doesn't like things to get too big and I, you know, he likes to keep it contained, you know, so, and so he sometimes will have a problem with another actor that's getting too big. And I used to kind of tease him and say, but the thing is, I can't be too big because <laughs> mm -hmm. I got Alzheimer's, yeah. you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he would, you know, I mean, you know, if you feel like somebody's not buying it and maybe you're not sure of it, well, you know, um, that's, that's I a, can't think of anything I've ever seen you do that I didn't buy. And 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 before we go, forty two. You know, did you did you know? I mean, what an important film to be. That that was such yeah. an important film. Yeah. It's such an important film. Yeah. I didn't uh, know what it was when I went in and read for it. Really, they didn't tell me because sometimes they get sort of precious about. We don't want people to know what this, mm. this, this script. You know, now you got to sign non disclosure things. You won't. Let anybody see them on a lot of shows and i guess there's a reason for that but uh in this case it wasn't so much that but i just didn't uh i didn't know it was a baseball movie mm -hmm. you know and then i uh so i read once for the uh casting director and then went back in and read for the director and uh and he said um he said do you uh have any questions by then i got because with him i got this is something I still didn't know who Jackie Robinson story, but I got that it was something. And I said, yeah, my question is, what do I have to do to get this part? <laughs> he said, well, I, you know, I'll tell you, you, you've got the part. Yeah. He said, I just, the only thing I have to say is, you know, I haven't quite figured out how I pay off this character yet. So I said, well, maybe we'll find it. And I thought we, I, I came up with something, an idea that did, but at the time I was, too shy to put it put it out there way back toward the end while it was there's a scene you know you don't see much of this guy but in fact he and the part that that, uh, that Harrison was playing mm -hmm. the guy that that, uh, that 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 ran the team and was the one who made the decision we're going to bring in a black athlete mm -hmm. and pick the one he did you know and and went about it the way he did and and, mm -hmm. and broke that and he had a history with this guy who was retired by then, uh, back when they were both in St. Louis. And, uh, and they, they used to go duck hunting together and fishing together. So he was the opposite. You know, Harrison's part was a, a real Brahmin, an East Coast Brahmin from a big wealthy family and all that. And this guy was a, from a farm, farm background. And, uh, you know, but they had a relationship. And so when, uh, when, um, the, the regular manager got fired because he was boffing a married woman or something like that, you know, a very flamboyant manager. And he got canned and people thought, oh, that man, the team's not going to do that well anyway. He reached out to his old friend who had retired. <clears throat> and um, so the scene, our biggest scene was I'm, I show up there, you know, and say, what's this all about, Branch? You know, and he's telling me he wants me to, Manager, I said, I told my wife, I, I never put on a uniform again because the manager always would. He says, well, you don't, you don't have to uh, uh, put on the uniform. You can wear your dress clothes, which is like, well, this, this is the kind of bullshit that a guy that's been married a few times might do, uh, but not the guy that's been <laughs> with the same wife, you know, but, he's, but he knows he's going to do it. He can't turn it down. You know, he can't say no. And I just, there was some dialogue there that I, I thought of, you know, because I say, well, they're over there. Uh, they were over where they were practicing. I knew they were practicing. I say, you better, you better tell, um, you better tell so and so, the the the, the, the uh, temporary manager, you know, that I'm coming. And uh, and I, I thought it would be good to say he. He says he already knows. And uh, and I and and then I would look at him like, so you you've been playing me this whole time. You you were sure you were going to get be able to do that, and and then he would say, 
It was his idea. And that would wrap up that part of it. And then the other part was there was a guy playing. Um, I remember that. I, I remember this. Yeah. There was, there was a guy playing the, the sports announcer who's read somebody, I think. But anyway, he was. And there was a point there where he, he's talking about, you know, it's up in the booth and he's talking about it. And there was a very good chance for him to say the most brilliant thing Branch did was to get this character, you know, to get him to come in and manage because nobody thought they were going to have a 50-50 season. And here they are playing for the, you know, they, they ended up not making the, the, uh, the World Series that year. They lost in the play. But, but anyway, it was just like, you know, it was just one of those times where I, I just was kind of into that character, you know, a guy who really paid attention, really knew how to work with people, but didn't, but never tried to grab the spotlight or anything. And I, I just kind of let the moment go by. But I still think about it when somebody comes up, you know. I'm going back and I'm going to watch that tonight. What a great movie that was. You know, the one wonderful thing about that was there were a whole bunch of people, A, you know, A, people sound and all of that, but working on a movie that was like, a, you know, a movie where everybody really cared. Mm -hmm. And then also getting to spend time with that, you know, wonderful young man. There were some young gals working on it as sort of interns. They'd been um, sort of coached by one of their professors that, well, you know, um, Jackie Robinson was, you know, he was a Republican. He was a little bit of, you know, an Oreo. He was a little bit, you know, because because they didn't really appreciate the times that he lived in and what he lived through, you know, and they mm -hmm. had this case they kind of wanted to make, you know, and, and here's a guy who's spent quite a bit of time doing theater and stuff. You know, he was not an overnight he, and writing. He, he, he had really developed his craft and he was a wonderful athlete and he developed all that, you know, all of that, but he was so patient with them. Mm. So sort of loving in his laughter as they're basically laying out this, you know, young bullshit deal on him. You know, this was not on set, but, you know, anyway, um, that was a great experience. That's Can so I share one of my short uh, rhymes with you? To Please wrap do. Up? <clears throat> this one uh, is uh, it's called Bigger, and it's, it starts bigger than you. And that's like the you, you. It's also the sort of capital you that people sometimes get hung up in. Who's the you you're praying to? You know, kind of that you, mm -hmm. you know? Bigger than you, bigger than me, bigger than all our hearts and minds can see, bigger than all we believe there to be, <clears throat> bigger than bondage, bigger than free, bigger than love, bigger than hate, bigger than destiny, bigger than fate, bigger than humble, bigger than great, bigger than race or religion or state, bigger than teacher or guru or sage, Bigger than sex, more youth, or age. Bigger than anger, resentment, or rage. Bigger than anything said on a page <clears throat> or a stage. Bigger than action, whatever we try. Bigger than all we accept or deny. Bigger than any one, what, why. Bigger than bigger and bigger than I. You're a beautiful man, Max Gale. <laughs> that was, that was You're a beautiful, dear, beautiful <laughs> man. Thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself yeah. today. I'm inviting yeah. you to dinner. I'm inviting Lauren Gold of the Who, and I'm inviting Paul Williams and Lorraine Newman, and we're going to have a wonderful dinner party. And I am so thrilled to um, have heard you and spent this time with you and to feel your heart. Yeah. Um, you're a beautiful Likewise. man. Likewise, I, I I can't quite say it would take one. It takes one to know one, but mm -hmm. uh, it takes one to know one. So thank right. you, Max. You know, you're a beautiful woman and a person. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening. I'm going to be in touch soon. All right. All right. Thank you bye so bye. much, Max.